welcome everyone to the other hand. So please put your hands together for yourselves and me. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is uh, Frank. I'm the director of the NYU Game Center. Um, I welcome you here. For those of you who this is your first time visiting, uh, um, I hope it won't be your last. Uh, in addition to being basically the the game design department of NYU, um, we also have um, a uh, we do a lot of events, uh, most of which are open to the public, um, and uh, so we have a. a, a great two-year graduate program in MFA in game design um, that um, if any of you are interested in going to graduate school and, and studying game design, please um, find out about that. If you know of anybody who is, uh, we're looking for talented and, and, and passionate uh, game designers who want to change the world. And um, we uh, have uh, a bunch of cool stuff coming up um, that is uh, going to be open to the public that I wanted to let you know about. Um, one of them is... Um, uh, an event that's happening on April 18th uh, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Doom and Myst, these two games that kind of changed uh, the, the, the history of, of video games. Um, uh, we're going to have a conversation with, between uh, John Romero and Rand Miller, the creator of those two games, or two of the creators of those games. And so that's, um, I believe we're almost sold out, but there might be some tickets left. Um, I invite you to come to that. Um, this weekend, there's a conference called Different Games. Um, which is going to be right here, and, and I encourage you all to come and, and check that out. Um, it's a conference about uh, new voices and um, new identities uh, in, in games. Uh, uh, women, people of color, uh, queer people, pe transgendered people. Um, there's a kind of new revolution happening in games in which um, people are trying to uh, open up the, the gates and, and, and welcome in lots of new kinds of, of people and communities uh, into the world of of video games, and so Different Games is, is about that, and um, I think you should uh, come check that out. And um, I believe tomorrow night, uh, Anna Kipnis, who is um, one, of the, uh, one of the creative leads at Double Fine, um, is going to be coming and speaking uh, at a tech talk, which is just right across uh, the quad here um, at the, uh, the Game Innovation Lab. So I invite you to, to come hear Anna speak tomorrow. Um, and. Um, if you want to find out more about the events that we're doing, you can always go to our, our website, uh, gamecenter.nyu.edu. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, some of our sponsors who helped make these events possible. Uh, Arcadium, Smashworks, Fresh Planet, Avalanche, Take-Two. These are all local game design studios and, and publishers who are um, helping us uh, in our mission to support games and game culture in New York City, because that's a big part of our identity and what we do. Um, so in addition to um, uh, making games, uh, some of our MFA students are interested in, in, in helping us curate um, amazing events. James Marion is the guy who put tonight's event together, and he's going to be your host for, for this event. So please put your hands together and turn over to James Marion. Introduce uh, former editorial director of GameSpot, Game GiantBomb.com co-founder, and one of Complex Magazine's 25 most important games people, Jeff Gerson. <laughs> That's yeah. a good start. Okay, Jeff, so uh, it's good to have you here. Thanks it's, for coming. It's great to be here. Awesome. I'm, I'm so very happy to be here. For those of us who don't know, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your career and where, you, where you've come from? Well, um, let's see. In uh, 1991, I was in my junior year of high school, and I decided to take a drama class. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, most people that take drama in high school, uh, they have these, you know, dramatic ambitions. They want to get on stage and connect with people. Like I was just watching a lot of kids in the hall and thought like it'd be fun to try to do that. Um, so there was really only one other guy uh, in, the, in the program that was interested in any kind of comedy or anything like that. It was a guy named Glenn Rubenstein. And he was uh, writing, in addition to being in high school and all this other stuff, he was writing game reviews for the local paper in our small suburban town. 
and uh, he was just about to go to his first trade show, which uh, back then that was before E3 was uh, before E3 existed. Uh, the Consumer Electronics Show happened twice a year in Chicago and Vegas, and he was getting ready to go uh, to one of those. So we kind of became fast friends, and he's like, you know what, you just come with me to this thing. We can figure out a way to fake credentials and get you into this trade show. <laughs> and I'm like, absolutely, I will totally go hang out in Chicago for four days and play unreleased Super Nintendo and Genesis games. So I convinced my parents to let me do that and, uh, and got out there and... Uh, you know, started trying to meet people and, and uh, met Andy McNamara, who now runs uh, Game Informer, um, mm. and kind of started slowly falling into that scene. It took about three years of going to that stuff and meeting people and talking and, and all that before it made sense, like, this is maybe something I want to do. Uh, and then uh, Glenn and I went to go work for a print magazine that lasts a little under a year, three full issues. They ran off with the money. <laughs> it was like a really good 19-year-old. Uh, it was like a way to get a 19-year-old super jaded about the, the way the world really works. <laughs> it was just, stuck. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then about a year after that, uh, the two of us ended up going to GameSpot, which was getting ready to launch a console site called Video GameSpot. Because this was before they realized that URL should be short. Like, <laughs> this big, long thing, so... Uh, in 96, we launched uh, Video Game Spot, and I was there for 11 years, yeah. uh, reviewing games, kind of rising through the ranks there from like assistant editor to eventually editorial director. So speaking of being there for 11 years, yeah. Uh, so instrumental to the founding of Giant Bomb was the Kane and Lynch scandal of 2007. Yeah. Yeah, which yeah. was an exciting time for you. It was. That's <laughs> yes, that is one way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was rumored for a long time that you were dismissed over. Uh, not even negative review of Kane and Lynch, a fair review of Kane and Lynch. I think that was the actual term you used. Uh, yes, it, it got a six. So I think the, the word that went under six reviews at that time was fair. Yeah. yeah. So um, in 2012, when you came back to GameSpot, or came back to CBSI, mm -hmm. um, you confirmed that that was the reason you were dismissed. And what followed that dismissal was this like incredibly touching uh, round of support from your fellow GameSpot editors. So I was wondering if you would tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was... Um, yeah, you know, that, that all kind of happened, uh, you know, there, were, there was a management team in there that, uh, you know, was very good at some things, and very, you know, very new to the notion of working with an editorial team and what that actually means in terms of editorial integrity and, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, they had uh, me, the guy who'd been there for a decade and frowned a lot, uh, <laughs> being the guy that had just actually cost them some hundreds of thousands of dollars, and people were like, oh, that's not the ads are getting pulled. We got to do something about so, it. So, so they actually did pull ads because of that review. Idos did. Uh, yeah, Idos threatened to pull ads. I don't know what actually happened uh, on that end of it, but you know there were a lot of people that were very unhappy yeah. about that sort of thing. It's not the first time that's happened. That's uh, you know that's a relatively common thing over the course of uh, you know a, a career in, in publishing. That sort of stuff is you know when when they're unhappy with your coverage, they will they'll push whatever button they can. Yeah. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll come and threaten to, to take money away from, from the business and stuff like that. The, the key things that you have to have in place are a team that understands that that's par for the course and shrugs it off. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you know, like we have to stand by, this is, this is what we do. If we, if we can't stand by this, then what are we? And uh, what you had there was a, a case of people that were in those positions that were new to those positions and didn't necessarily understand that. Yeah. Um, so for me and for a lot of others, that was a really important moment in games because it kind of solidified their importance as a medium. Um, and in any medium, there's probably some amount of corruption in how reviews work. Maybe. But did yeah. it feel important when it happened? Uh, it felt crushing when it happened. Uh, I mean, it was important to me because, you know, it's like I had uh, bills due and you know, all this other stuff. And, you know, I've been, you know, on this path since, uh, since I was 16. So quite literally, I knew nothing else. <laughs> so it was like, all right, okay, did this for this chunk of time. Now it's like, okay, now what? Um, and you know, kind of talked about it with uh, some friends, and there was this notion very early on of like, well, you know, like I could go become a producer to publisher or something, and fill out spreadsheets or whatever it is the producers do. Um, so it had it had to be really. It had to really touch you when uh, Ryan, Vinnie, Brad, and I believe it was Alex left uh, GameSpot in solidarity. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, uh, people were not very happy with the way that place was being run, and, and uh, you know, a, a chunk of people did get out of there. It was, it was very touching, and, um, 
you know, some of them, uh, the, the, the guys you listed off all uh, miraculously ended up working for me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, so let's talk about Giant Bomb. So everyone, most of the people here know what Giant Bomb is, but for those who don't, it's, um, would you describe it as personality-based journalism? Yeah, I guess. I mean, the, the journalism side of it is the, is the part that I think is a, a bit of a gray area these days. So, <laughs> sure. you know, in, in terms so of just like... Just a personality side. Uh, I mean, we try to cover games, and I think, you know, the, the, the difference is, you know, you can't go full, you know, a lot of people do just go full personality and, and yeah. don't consider, uh, you know, what, what they're saying, how that, what they're saying impacts people and, and their buying decisions and stuff like that. And you see a lot of that on YouTube these days. You see a lot of that on Twitch these days of, you know, people that are dedicating themselves to live streaming all the time. And, you know, some of them are, are very much thinking about that end of it, and I think that is where it starts to rub up against journalism and, and what we think of when we think about games journalism yeah. but there are some people that are just like whatever I'm just doing this and I'm making money and I'm just having fun um, so when we started Giant Bomb the original idea is you know it was kind of twofold I think we took the things that we liked doing at GameSpot which ended up being the more personality driven stuff like a podcast uh, like a live show um, and, and those sorts of things kind of outside the standard reviews previews features news grind mm -hmm. and building a site around that um, and what I really wanted to do was to try to showcase the personalities of the people that are out there making games and, and kind of tell their stories. And uh, that's, it's, it's a, even then it was a really counterintuitive thing to do because if you go and you look at like the, the sad truth about most interviews of uh, game developers on the internet is they don't traffic very well. Hmm. You go look at a site like GameSpot, you go look at all the other sites, like you see they don't do the stick mic interviews that they used to at events. It's because no one was watching them. Uh, but I always felt really strongly about that. You know, the, the, like these people are interesting. A lot of them are really funny. They just don't get their shot, and it's really hard to get them out from under so, kind of the, the PR cycle. So I wanted to focus on that. Uh, and as a result of that, it, it kind of drew us out of our shells a little bit further, too, to kind of just try to have fun around video games while still taking it just seriously enough that we're not being pushed over or, you know, being taken advantage of or, or anything like that. Right. So is anyone here a subscriber? Woo! Okay, cool. And <laughs> clap if you watch Giant Bomb videos pretty regularly. So, so you're doing pretty okay? Seems like it, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, I mean, we've been growing, you know. Um, we, we started out independent and went uh, a little over five years that way as part of Whiskey Media. We had a you know, movie and TV site and a tech site and all this other stuff. And, you know, that, uh, you know... We were a little bit early on some of the bets we placed with that company, I think, in terms of, you know, it's one of those things you look at uh, where the ad market is, and you go like, okay, the ad market's crumbling, so, you know, we should have a subscription service, because that's going to be the way forward. Yeah. The ad market didn't crumble quite as quickly as we thought, you know, people didn't necessarily transfer over as quickly as we thought, but we had this, this growing subscription video business, and that was one of the things that, you know, when you blow that up to a scale of a much larger video game website and look at the ad market starting to erode, you're like, well, we got to do something. <laughs> so uh, I think that made us pretty attractive uh, when it came time to uh, start looking to see if anyone wanted to, to buy the company. So as far as what's actually on Giant Bomb, did you ever consider Giant Bomb a review site? Uh, to a certain extent, um, yes, because like by and large, that's what I've spent the bulk of my career doing and worrying about was reviews of games. Um, so we, we started out thinking about that stuff very clear, clearly and thinking, well, we wanted a video focus, but we weren't really sure. You know, when we first started buying video equipment, we didn't have any video editors yet. Uh, we're like hanging up a green screen and it's going like, I don't know how any of this works. You know, it's like the, the business guy came back and said, I bought the most expensive Mac they would sell me. <laughs> like, All right, set it up. I don't know how any of this shit works, but we'll get there. Um, and, you know, we brought uh, Vinny in, who we, we'd worked with Vinny at, at GameSpot uh, on a lot of video production stuff. We, we brought him in and he said, all right, you don't know what you're doing, let me, <laughs> I'll take care of this. So uh, when you worked at GameSpot, I believe reviews were on a 100, 100 point scale? Was... We changed it, so uh, when, when GameSpot launched, it was on uh, a, yes, yeah, so it was on a decimal points, it was on a 100 point scale, and it was even further than that, it was determined by a system of weighted averages on five component scores. So a reviewer would plug in five scores for uh, graphics, gameplay, sound, value, and reviewer's tilt. 
uh, which was like, you know, if, if you added up those other averages, the score didn't come out quite the way you liked it, you go, well, I'm going to bump up tilt a little mm. bit to kind of offset that, because I really feel it's a 7-3 instead of a 7-0. No. <laughs> um, so, so how did you land on the five-star five, five review scale for Giant Bomb? Well, so I wanted to make that change at GameSpot. In 2006, I started rebuilding the review system at GameSpot, and we changed it to a 19-point scale that was 1.0 at half-point increments. Okay. Uh, and that came with an emblem system that was like, here are the good things about this game. The graphics are good, here's the bad thing. The frame rate's terrible, you know, like that sort of stuff. Uh, but I originally wanted that to be a five-star system, uh, but at the time, I got in an argument with uh, Joe Fielder, who was my boss at the time, and he went to Irrational, and he's been around. Uh, he thought it should be a four-star scale because he liked movie reviews that were four stars, and I said, that's crazy, it has to be five. And since we couldn't come to any kind of conclusion on that, we went through the 19-point scale and stuff. Uh, so when it came time to build Giant Bomb, like, you know, it, it was a chance to really rethink uh, reviews and re really just or really rethink kind of the, the scoring system. And I always felt, you know, we, we kind of set out and realized, like, okay, there are really only five ways to feel about a game when it comes to this stuff. It's you know, it's either it's outstanding, it's it's pretty good, it's okay, it's kind of bad, and ugh. Uh, so once we kind of came to that, I was like, okay, this this should be a five star system, no half points, no nothing, uh, and uh, that had the added benefit of, of I feel fitting into like the Metacritic system really well, uh, whereas a lot of other sites get mired in this like seven is the lowest they go stuff. Like if you use that whole scale, you know, the three on Meta, uh, the sixty on Metacritic, which is how the three worked out, is yellow scale. The yeah. four and five are green, and the one and two are red. And I look at it and go, yeah, that's basically right. what we're saying about games. Yeah. So um, reviews have become less and less common on the site. And you used to do video reviews. Those have stopped over mm -hmm. the last year or two. Yeah. Um, so do you feel like we're moving towards a review-free review future? Well, if you think about you know what's out there on the internet uh, and, and what's popular on the internet, it's there's a lot of video of games out there, and you have a lot of people that are making their purchasing decisions based on watching long, uninterrupted clips of gameplay. Uh, the thing we hear, you know, we do uh, we do quick looks, which are you know videos that are anywhere from 40 minutes to two days. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and that's just a, an unedited, solid clip of a game. And the thing we kept hearing from people is more and more is just like you know this is way more valuable to me than a review because uh, I can look at this and hear you guys talking about it in the moment and get a sense of what this chunk of this game is, and then I can figure out the rest from there. With Giant Bomb, you know, we're not the largest site in the world. We don't have to attempt to appeal to this huge mainstream audience that's just like going to Google and typing in Titanfall codes. So, uh, by the way, there are no cheat codes for Titanfall. They never find anything. Um, and, and by, you know, kind of aiming a little bit smaller, like we're, we're attracting an audience that tends to be a little more savvy and we're finding that like the reviews are interesting, and, and I, you know, I think some of us really like to write them. I know Alex likes writing reviews, um, uh, because we've done it for so long, and, and I think it serves a purpose. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, like it, it even feels like that five star system feels a little less relevant. And we're at a point now, you know, when we first started writing reviews at GameSpot, we had this idea in our head that these were objective scores. We were trying to take ourselves out of the equation as much as possible. And it led to situations where, like, I'm giving The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask some kind of eight or something while hating it. Um, and and that's, that's a terrible game. Uh, oh, yes, yes. You got six people on your side. So. The six of us are up. We're going to take this. Oh, wait, wait. Who likes Yoshi's Island? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's right. This is your crap. East Coast, man, more real, more vital. Yes. <laughs> so you were mentioning Metacritic, and um, it seems like Metacritic's, how companies are using Metacritic to assign bonuses to developers and stuff places some sort of weird responsibility on reviewers that they didn't sign up for. Yeah, do it, it does, and it puts us in a position where, like, you know, I think the original idea was, like, you know, uh, by putting enough of our personalities out there, we should be able to review any game, and you should be able to look at it and know well, of course he's going to say this about a football game. He doesn't understand the rules of football. <laughs> um, but within the Metacritic system, that ends up being super unfair to the people making those games. Yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, on one hand, it's like, well, maybe, you know, we really shouldn't care about that. Like, that's the, you know, anyone signing contracts that give them bonuses based on Metacritic knew what they were signing up for when they got it, and maybe they should have been a little bit better on the business end uh, of that stuff. But... 
that's just not the reality of it. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's led to situations where, like, you know, we're, we're kind of, like, we write reviews in a very similar way to the way we, we wrote them at GameSpot. We score them in a relatively similar way. Uh, we assign them in an extremely similar way, where it's like, I'm taking the shooters, I'm the shooter guy, and Brad takes these games, now Alex takes the terrible games. And, you know, <laughs> kind of, we just work in, in, in that way, because it was very familiar to us, and it ends up just working in that system. And that's been really frustrating for me. It's been one of the things that's been, you know, bothering me for about the last year now, is kind of the, the difference between, like, those, like, those types of score reviews, and just kind of crossing the line, getting more into actual criticism, Instead of just the straight up product review. Because like I said, you know, there's so much video of a game out there. People can make decisions in so many different ways. There are so many other just straight up bland reviews. Mm. Like, are we really adding value to this discussion by just having one more review? Uh, so I, I want to look for ways to just like, if it, if it makes sense to stay in that system, then great. If it doesn't, then let's get the scores off the reviews. Let's just stop writing reviews. We'll focus more on quick looks and start thinking about kind of longer after the fact criticism. Uh, and, and kind of building around that. So uh, I spoke with some of my peers about your site and other journalism sites, journalism in general mm -hmm. and games, and there seems to be some contention as far as what your responsibility is as journalists. And um, I was thinking, we're very interested here at NYU about indie games and the indie game scene and especially the New York scene, of course. Yeah. And there's a lot of different games, like our, like our conference this weekend. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, do you think it's in any part your responsibility as a journalist to show these games to people because you have this audience? I think so. Uh, I, I do think so. But I, I can only really speak for us and, and speak for Giant Bomb in that because I think every different publication is going to have its own marching orders and every publication is going to deal with its own business realities. Um, for us, you know, the, the interesting thing, you know, so at one point back in the day, we, we ran an anime, we didn't run it, we, the company also had an anime site. Mm -hmm. And the people that ran the anime site, great people, but they, they were very specifically into smaller, very obscure stuff, and that was the stuff they liked to cover. And when you went to them and said, like, you know, if you wrote about uh, Dragon Ball Z, you would build this site into this larger thing. And they're like, well, fuck you. And they're like, okay, well, that's fine. <laughs> uh, we ended up covering, you know, it, for us, I think, for us, it's, it's about establishing our positions on the larger games mm -hmm. and being a trustworthy voice for those games uh, and being a trustworthy voice across the board so that when we come to you and say like, no, you really need to see Proteus, you really need to see this other game, that they will come along for the ride. And I think that, that there is an element of advocacy to what we do in terms of uh, acting as curators, acting as a filter and saying like, you know, here are the games, like there, you know, you could spend your time playing games constantly and, and, you know, never encounter these little things. Like, let's make sure we're, we're looking at Crawl, we're looking at some of these early access games, and, and figuring out where to draw that line uh, is, is really challenging. So, do you feel that a game's budget or a team size should have any effect on the way you review it or the way you look at it? No. No. Okay. No. It's, it's, at the end of the day, the money's the money. You know, if, if, a, if a team of four people is putting out a game for $60 and a, you know, Titanfall is $60, at some point, a consumer is going to make an equivalency there, whether you like it or not. Uh, and I think that's, that's me speaking as a reviewer. That's me speaking as someone who has spent a long time reviewing games. Mm -hmm. I think outside of that, there are way more interesting stories to tell about that smaller team and that smaller team's journey to getting a game out there. Um, but you know, in, in the review sense, in kind of the traditional product review sense, you know, the, the behind the scenes stories, the troubled development of a game, like, you know, it doesn't matter if a game got canceled and restarted three times on its way out, like someone just needs to know if I buy this game, am I going to enjoy it or not? Yeah. Uh, and and that's, that's, I think, the, the real focus for reviews. But reviews are only one part of the site and one part of every site. I think that's the, the, the thing that people like to forget uh, is that you know, we have podcasts, we have video interviews, we have all these different ways to talk about these games. And it's not just about the review, it's not just about what is it being compared to. So uh, here at NYU, we're really interested in games as an academic study. Mm -hmm. We study games the way Tish studies film. Um, and I was wondering what you think, what place you think criticism has on a site like Giant Bomb? Because to me, it seems like you're offering very serious criticism in a, in a fun way. In a, in a way that isn't too self-serious, that doesn't turn people away because of petty academic language. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think there, there's definitely a, a place for it. I, I think it's, it's something that is really only just starting to find its voice out there. Uh, you know, if you think, you know, I think back to like the early GameSpot days, it was like that sort of thing. You just look at it and just like, 
no, come on. What what do you this isn't these are just you're just shooting people in the face over and over again. It's not yeah. it's not worthy of a larger discussion. Yeah. Uh, but we're at a point now where, you know, gaming is so much bigger and, and and so much more important in a lot of ways that I think that we're just now starting to get to a point where those conversations are getting extremely interesting. So since we might see reviews headed on the way out, do you see yourself spending the time you would spend writing reviews, writing maybe essays or articles about games and what they mean? Maybe, um, maybe. You know, me personally, you know, at, at some point, like we're we're a very video focused site, so I think you know it, it might make more sense to kind of go into uh, spending more time on, on that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, maybe. I, I'd actually, you know, it's one of the things I talk to Patrick, who's our, our news editor, a lot about. Like, I've been kind of trying to get him a freelance budget for a little while, just so we can get different voices on the site yeah. and kind of get some essays and get something, you know, of substance uh, there, too. Cool. So, uh, we're going to be moving to Q&A shortly. So, if people have questions, they can, I guess, line up on the side over here. Not a single person. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> so, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So, um, <laughs> um, so fairly selfishly, I'd like to know what you think of schools like NYU Game Center, schools that are focusing on academic study of games, how that, how do you think that might affect the industry of your games coming out? I think it's really crazy. You know, it's one of those things that like, you know, I've been doing this for about 20 years now, and you know, when I first started going to trade shows and stuff like that, there were no creators there. The, the video game industry in the US was primarily salesmen in suits that didn't know what they were selling. Just going like, I don't know, the kids love this game, let's go get some drinks. And, you know, just real, just real, just Jack Tretton types, you know, just real, just roll up your sleeves type. Yeah, I mean, and, and Jack came a long way and, you know, like did a, a great job and, and, and really grew, but, you know, he started as a sales guy. Uh, and that was the bulk of the U.S. game industry, or at least as I saw it as a, as a journalist coming in, like everyone I was talking to didn't know anything about games. Uh, and it was just, it was, it was frustrating to not be able to have those conversations. And, you know, when I started, there was no career path into what I do. There was no set career path into game development, uh, especially in the U.S. at that time. You know, it was very console focused, kind of the, the, the we're in that lull kind of post Commodore 64 kind of rise of the PC type stuff. Um, and then that started growing out of Europe. You know, you had the, the PC scene in, in the US really pick up as the shooters started to get popular. And then, weirdly enough, like the, the PC developers won. Uh, and now the, the most desired games for consoles come out of like that legacy. Uh, but there still wasn't any set path for that. It was like guys like Cliff Blazinski designing games in his house and convincing Epic to hire him uh, and, and driving away in his Ferrari or whatever. <laughs> uh, and the idea that there's now a path, even if it's not the perfect path, like a, a path that can be designed and honed over time, uh, is just huge. Because, you know, I, I, when I was, uh, you know, b before I kind of got into the writing end of it, there was a period of time where I'm like, oh, it'd be really cool to make games. Hmm. But, like, how, you know, how do you even do that? The tools weren't there for me to get started on my own, really. Uh, I didn't have the patience to, to bang through that stuff, you know. But now it's, you know, Programs like this, uh, stuff like Game Maker, Twine, just like all the different packages that are out there that would you make look it possible. Would you want to try your hand at making a game? Maybe. 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 Uh, <laughs> game Maker was on sale on the, in the Steam sale over the holidays. So <laughs> one of these days, if I can clear out some time, I'll start going through the tutorials and probably make something terrible. So, um, <laughs> Windjammer, making a new Windjammer. That's you. That's yeah. The the license is look. I've talked to people about the license. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a mess. Two very important questions. All right. So first is where is the industry headed? Uh, we see VR taking off. Is it going to take off and it's going to immediately crash? No, no, okay. it's not going to immediately crash. But it's not going to be the end all be all. It's not going to be some gigantic mainstream thing overnight either. You know, it, it, it's going to be a very long haul. Uh, if you just think about the awareness end of it and the idea that like they have to get these kiosks into all of these retail stores and then have someone stand by them to wipe the pink eye out of them between every <laughs> demo. Uh, like there's still logistics of getting people to understand that VR is actually worthwhile uh, is extremely difficult. So that's, you know, it's gonna take, let's say about $2 billion to really get that uh, out there in a, in a mainstream way, but it, it's, it's, it's a very much a long haul. The other really important question is um, Nintendo. Mm -hmm. What the fuck? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, Japan is in a really weird spot. It has been for a long time. Like I said, the PC developers won. Uh, and it was interesting to see, uh, you know, like games have diversified. The, the people that play them, 
uh, the types of games that can be out there, the, the big games, the small games, like we're at a point now where there's, there's more variety in games than there ever has been before. Uh, but at the same time, you have Japan sticking to kind of a very old blueprint. And I think if you start to look at all the different factors, you know, you've got Japan with like a very low birth rate. They've got an aging population. You start to wonder, like, are they just aging out of video games yeah. uh, and not replacing people fast enough to keep that going? Uh, and, you know, there was a, a comment from someone at Square very recently talking about Bravely Default, saying, like, we had no idea this game was going to be that popular because uh, it was such this weirdly specific, narrow thing. And we've been trying to make games for war worldwide audiences, and they've all been terrible. Uh, but this one, you know, so it, it was an interesting admission from them that they're like, well, maybe we can just go back to making games the way we thought we were making them back then, and, and they'll still find an audience. So the idea that a company like Square who used to not send us games because we were a website and they figured that meant we were hackers. <laughs> uh, well, you kind of are. A little bit, a little bit. Uh, that, they would, that they would then come to this uh, realization is, is huge. Uh, but Nintendo, generally speaking, yeah, it's, uh, you know, they're, I think they're in a tough spot with their hardware. Uh, mm -hmm. They are maybe in a tough spot on the software end as well. Like the, the new ideas are not necessarily coming along. The, the iterations on existing ideas are. And at some point, you just have to wonder, like, who are those games really for? And is that something that a bulk of people still want? And if it's not, then how do they make that work from a business end? Does it need to be their hardware? Probably not. Hmm. You know, it's, it's a hard thing to think about. Uh, and a lot of people get very angry when you bring it up. But, I, you know, people, I don't think people are bringing up the idea of Nintendo as a third-party company maliciously. Yeah. Uh, it just seems like one of those things that, like, if you could free Nintendo from the shackles of having to make all this hardware and spend all this money on R&D, then they could be reinvesting more heavily into, uh, into the software and taking more risks. Yeah. Right, there, right now they're at this point where it's like they need to sell more Wii U's. So they're like, all right, Mario Kart, Smash Brothers, what else we got? You want to make a Metroid game? No? All right. Uh, <laughs> let's get EAD on another Mario game. And, mm. yeah. uh, so last thing before we go to Q&A from this audience, I asked the forums if they had any questions. Yeah. Of course inappropriate sure. questions yeah. with most of them. Right. <laughs> so this is this is word for word. This is not my opinion. <laughs> okay. uh, that's a great disclaimer to say. Is, yeah. is debating about sexism in games actually going to change anything? <sighs> or do the games need to usher in the change themselves? Uh, I think the, I think it's a little bit of both. You know, you know uh, I think that uh, the debate is, is great from an awareness perspective. Of making people understand that, yeah, you know, there's a world outside of yourself. There are people that are not like you, and those people should have games tailored to them as well. Uh, and and everyone should be able to enjoy games on on an equal level. Uh, and you know, it, it hasn't been like that for a long time. You know, it's like when my dad was taking me to arcades when I was five. My mom would go and play Pac-Man in the corner, and then she stopped going, and that, there were no more women in the arcade. And it's been like that kind of ever since. Yeah. So uh, in, in those arcades that we have. Yeah, in all those arcades we have now. You have the fun spot right now. Yeah. So um, related to that, uh, a user pointed out that when you started Giant Bomb, there seemed to be this implicit in acknowledgement that you weren't going to tackle politics, or political ideas. Whether that's true or not. <laughs> Whether that's true uh, or not. Yeah, uh, okay. It's this dude. Yeah. Um, do you feel that you've gotten more political over the last year or two, or a couple years? I just think the, the climate is different, and I think that, you know, like, games are maturing and, and games are evolving and that's not a political statement that's just a reality mm -hmm. so the the people taking that to mean that we're getting political like that just makes me think that they're just out of touch yep. with, with kind of where stuff is, is is heading and it's not about you know drilling it into everyone's skull it's not about like we're gonna hold your eyes open and force gone home into your eye sockets until you <laughs> understand <laughs> uh, it's just about saying that like not every game has to be for you yeah there are plenty of games I don't like that other people do. And if people want to play Dark Souls, fine. <laughs> I don't have to. And that's okay. Yeah. You'll eventually have to play Dark Souls. <laughs> so last, last question from the site is, you've expressed a desire to build a giant bomb into something much bigger in the past. Um, and you've said that your, your viewership's increasing year over year. Yeah. Subscribers as well. Yeah. So what, what does that look like? What does a bigger giant bomb look like? Uh, that's a, that is a great question. We're trying to figure that out right now. Um, you know, we're, we're at a point now where we are six people, uh, two of which are not in the main office. So with the, the four of us in San Francisco and uh, in being in the middle of 
you know, meetings to make sure that we have an E3 space and meetings to make sure that, you know, we're, we're on track to get this business stuff, you know, to get the investment that we need to go out and hire people and all this other stuff. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where while I'm out doing that, kind of trying to secure the site's future, like right now there's just not a lot of stuff going up on the site or, or not as much as I would like. So, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. But, uh, you know, I want to bring in some additional people to kind of support what we're already doing uh, to kind of give me the ability to focus on something larger. I think mm -hmm. that right now, uh, you know, we have a subscription offering and, and part of that is, uh, you know, video content that is exclusive for those subscribers. We do a really bad job of telling people what that stuff is. They kind of have to sign up on faith. So, you know, we kind of need to be better about what that stuff is and how that stuff is surfaced. And I want to do more things around that. And I want to do larger things around that. Uh, you know, mini series where we're, we're getting out of the office. We're, we're going out there and exploring the world in search of these specific stories that I want to chase down. Awesome. Um, more, more stuff like building the Bastion, where you followed the Bastion team for? Yeah, something like that. You know, that, that ended up being a weird shoestring where I bought a camera, gave them the camera. <laughs> they filmed the development of Bastion gave us the camera back, Vinny edited it into whatever weekly piece, then we gave him the camera back. So, funny story about the Bastion stuff is that at the end of that process, they kept my camera. <laughs> <laughs> and they have spent like the last two or three years filming Transistor start to finish. Hmm. And they have all that footage and we are likely going to get our hands on it at some point. Awesome. Um, so I don't even know what that is because I haven't seen any of it. Yeah. I know that parts of it were a little contentious, uh, and they filmed some parts of that. So you know, we'll get some reality show drama. Cool. There, but, so uh, I'm gonna start taking questions yeah. from over here. If you want to switch seats? Hey, hey. Um, so first off, thanks for coming out to New York and taking uh, questions and doing the talk. Yeah. I know you have a big fan base in New York, whether or not you know that. Um, <laughs> no, you guys are so San Francisco specific since the main. I mean, just like walking around the neighborhood and just the amount of like hip hop coming out of restaurants and cars and stuff. It's really you guys Probably move. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know if you know that San Francisco's terrible. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, <laughs> so first off, I just want to compliment you and Alex and the team at Giant Bomb for what you've been able to accomplish in a lot of the content that you create really makes the user base feel like they're kind of part of the crew. Like they're, you know, the whole duder mentality is not something that I think happened by accident. And my question is, your community on the site is so much more positive than the vast majority of other communities that I and many other users have been part of. Is that because of the transparency that you guys have from your personality? Is that just great mods? Is it the premium model, or is it something else? I mean, apart from the fact that the chat is often toxic, but that's a chat. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, chat is often toxic. I think comments on some stories can get bad. You know, there's there's definitely pockets of it that get uh, a little rotten. I think you're, you're going to get that with any community, especially as it grows. You know, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it's a lot easier with a smaller site to, uh, to keep it positive. Everyone knows everyone. Uh, and, and yeah, I think part of that is, is you know good solid moderation. Though a lot of people who get banned certainly don't think our moderator is very good. Uh, but why? Of course they wouldn't. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, I, th I think you know we, we try to we try to be out there, and you know I, I don't spend as much time posting on our boards as I would like, um, but I, I do try to, to read a lot of that stuff and, and try to try to take that stuff under consideration. Sure. Yeah, I know I was shocked when you did the transition. And I got an email from Drew saying that my password wasn't working. And I was like, oh my god. And then Dave sent me an email and I was like, this is the real Dave. <laughs> He's helping me troubleshoot my problems with authentication. Yeah, what they call that is a support nightmare. <laughs> Everyone has to stop doing what they normally do. It's like, no, the site is broken. We all need to help with this. I worked in software design. Yeah, that's pathetic to that. Yeah, there was a lot of, I mean, that, that you know, the, the launch of the site was like that too. Because we do have the wiki. We let users uh, edit pages and, 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 you know, fill out information about games. And it was like, that was the, the early thing of like, oh, this is actually going to work. We're going to be okay. It is on day one. It was just the, the wiki submissions were insane. Like we were kind of up for two or three days straight just moderating yeah. uh, all that stuff. Cool. Thanks a lot. So speaking of the wiki, you have this weird combination of Giant Bomb of half 
just informational site. You yeah. have such a huge wiki. It's a weird site. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> what is the balance for you between that stuff and the critique? I love the wiki. Uh, the wiki does not get the attention it needs right now, and that's something that uh, I am in the process of trying to rebuild a lot of it. Uh, it needs a dedicated homepage that tells people, like, here are the popular pages, here are the new pages, here are the pages that need some help. But, like, I spend nights and weekends occasionally just filling out credits on pages and attaching human beings to video games and characters to stuff and putting in release dates and stuff like that. Like, I, I really love that stuff. I, I think it's, it's really important. Uh, and, and it's uh, it's something I, I definitely want to put more of a focus on um, in the future. Next. Hey, so I'm curious uh, with Giant Bomb being one of the few large sites that sort of doesn't do the every video game has to get reviewed the second the embargo lifts. <laughs> I'm curious what your guys' feelings are, kind of on spoilers and how you dance around that stuff in discussion. Sort of what's what's the value in being really circumspect in preserving somebody's blind experience versus right. having the ability to go in depth with it. I, I wish that, uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, it, that's that's kind of a weird struggle uh, that we, we skirt up that line and makes people angry from time to time on the podcast, but that's, that's why. Well, um, and it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. There, there's no specific line right now. I don't sit there, you know, I'm not looking at a calendar and going like, okay, 30 days have passed, we can talk about, sure. you know, it's not that specific. Uh, I think in a perfect world, we would just be out there talking about it immediately, and people would kind of know to not uh, look at some stuff. And, and there are definitely some people that are like, I'm not going to watch your Dark Souls 2 videos until for the next three weeks. Then I'm going to come back and watch them. I'm like, okay. Uh, as long as I watch them, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think you know that's one of those things where there's nothing wrong with warning people, uh, but, but I tend to fall on the side of like, if, if I'm going to write something uh, that's not a review. I think re reviews are a little bit different because it's you know you're ostensibly speaking to someone who hasn't purchased the game yet. Uh, so at that point, you, there are things you need to write around, or you know you, you need to make your points. But in some cases, you kind of need to try to not spell everything out. Uh, but you know if I'm coming back to a game two weeks later or something like that, and have something very specific to say about the ending, right. I'll want to say it, uh, and it's just a matter of like, do we tag that properly? You know how do how do we convey to people like, hey, you might not want to read this yet. Um, it's, it's a weird balancing act, and I hate the internet because of that stuff. Like, there's so many people just like, don't talk about Game of Thrones on Twitter. I'm like, oh, who cares? <laughs> That's my example, man. Yeah. Even though like I'm the least worried about spoilers, like I saw that Game of Thrones thing at the end of season three, and I was like, oh, man, I know what that. Means. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, but like for the Ground Zeroes thing recently, right? Like. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of the best you got out of the review was like, hey, there's some kind of icky stuff in here that you might not want to, might influence your decision to play it, but I can't really tell you what it's about because this is a review. Yeah, that, that, so, stuff's, that stuff's really crazy because, you know, in, in, or in some cases, you know, like some of the stuff in Ground Zero specifically is buried so deep that a reviewer might not have found it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, you encounter that from both ends for sure. Thanks. Hey, Jeff. Hey. So, um, Giant Ball's been pretty successful, you know, as far as video game sites go. So, you know, thanks out. Um, but you guys have specifically managed to do that by, instead of trying to be everyone for everything, like everything for everyone, like GameSpot was, you kind of doubled down on smaller niches and like other sites are finding a lot of success that way, like Kotaku comes to mind. Um, it seems those sites are outgrowing sites that try to have like a, a bigger uh, reach in terms of what they cover. What does that mean about the direction talking about games is going, and how does that affect you as a guy who makes important decisions about a video game website? Um, I mean, it's good. For, for my part, you know, I mean, uh, if everything was going great in the big general game site category, we wouldn't have gotten bought. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where uh, people used to think about those like big siloed sites. It's just like, here's this one-stop shop, you know, social media didn't exist in, in, in the GameSpot era. So, you know, we had, we hosted all our own videos. We did all, you know, all of our own reviews were all right there. If you want to interact with the staff, this is the website to go. Um, and I just feel like that way is ending uh, in, in a lot of ways, or, or in some ways already has. You know, uh, those sites are never going to be as big as they were in their heyday. IGN, all that stuff, you know, IGN's going after 
Uh, right. You know, music and movies and TV and all that other stuff too. You know, meanwhile, GameSpot's kind of diversified its traffic across Game Facts and now Giant Bomb, and they have an esports <laughs> site. Uh, and it's a you know they're kind of two very different approaches. But I think the same thing is clear is that you know other than those sites kind of relying on Google, thinking very highly of them because they've been around forever. Uh, you know, that stuff you can kind of find everywhere. So I think the the challenge for websites that have been around like that for a very long time is like how do you remain relevant in an era where you know, one post on Twitter, one Facebook status update uh, is the equivalent of your what used to be your entire news story, what used to be, you know, a, a page view and all that other stuff. Uh, and we were lucky to be building Giant Bomb as that stuff was happening. Uh, so, you know, we were kind of already using Twitter fairly heavily in 07, 08. Um, and, you know, a lot of that stuff just made sense. You know, we still have message boards and stuff like that, but, you know, if things keep heading this way, at what point is it just like, well, I mean, you see a lot of, you yeah. know, sites using Facebook for comments and stuff like that. Right. You know, at what point is that just the norm? Uh, and and then all of a sudden, all of those websites are losing out on all that traffic they used to just get through the churn of comments and forum posts. Uh, so, so judging by the fact that you've returned to, or you're partners with GameSpot and CSI, I assume that you feel that their level of quality has improved significantly. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it's one of those things where, I mean, there are some people that were there, you know, back from before when I was there, and, and there were plenty of great people there. Uh, you know, they just, uh, they, there were a few people there making some pretty poor decisions, and not too long after I was not there anymore, neither were they. Since you rejoined with them, do you feel like that site's rubbed off on Giant Bomb at all, or vice versa? Uh, maybe not as much as I think that they would have hoped. Uh, when they picked us <laughs> up, I think, to some extent. Um, what, sorry, what happened to that show you were doing with them weekly? Uh, so, uh, we wanted to do a weekly show. This is something that we talked about even before we were with uh, CBS. Vinny, Vinny and I uh, had this idea of, or you know, like, like Vinny kind of came, came up with it, and I was like, yeah, we should do this, uh, of like, let's do a weekly show where we just play every single new release and talk about it. So when the time came to like, you know, be there with GameSpot, we're like, you know, like GameSpot's a review site. Like, they have reviewers reviewing these games in time for release, like this would be great because there will always be someone at GameSpot that can come on to talk about their experience with the game. Uh, but they have gone in a very freelance heavy direction now uh, to where they have some reviewers in house but a lot of the games are getting reviewed by people that are external to the site. Uh, so week after week we found like, okay we need someone to come talk about this game and everyone's like mm. so with that in mind like the show just wasn't really able to fulfill that original purpose so uh, we just ended up killing it. Jeff, uh, so you touched on this a little bit, but uh, I'm a really big believer in VR, you know, pink eye issues aside. So I'm curious what, where you see, like, you know, all this, you know, we've got, uh, you know, I can swear consumer version one coming out soon, we've got Morpheus, got whatever the hell the other thing was that was announced. Uh, so I'm wondering, where do you think this is going to be in like seven or eight years, like a whole console generation away? Like, is there any way to even think about what that's going to be, or you know, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I, on some level, I feel like if I knew that, I would be making a bunch of money on it somewhere. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a really hard thing to, to predict. Uh, and it, it's the sort of thing that you could just see mainstream consumers completely reject it. You know? Like if it, yeah, they, if they, they could, it could be a point where they just, they just like, I'm not going to strap that to my head. Like, what if I get mugged or, you know, someone's going to break into my house while I'm in, <laughs> in cyberspace? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, about it, and it was a perspective that I hadn't really considered, but, you know, he's got two kids, and he had this, this idea, you know, he's like, you know, VR's great, but I just, I can't disappear. You know, I've got two kids running around the house, and my wife, it's, I can't just, like, vanish for seven hours straight uh, into fun land, you know? So it's, I think that that sort of stuff is going to color the experiences that will come. Maybe you think it might combine to be more, like, you know, two people side by side and still side by side in the game. You know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could, yeah, you could definitely have multiple headsets and, and two people in there and all, all online experiences that could be really fascinating too. Do you, do you see a future where there are four people in a family sitting in a room with headsets on looking in different directions? <laughs> I mean, I'd like to think that at some point, you know, like the, the VR headset is sort of just the first step and we eventually get to something greater. Uh, you know, proper implants into our brains. <laughs> Let's go. We're going right now. Uh, no, I, I, you know, I think that it's a, it's a great first step, but you know, at some point you're going to bump into that resistance from from people that either feel like oh, I don't want to look silly, or you know, or or just have time constraints, uh, and, and that that'll hold it back. But I think the potential is there for 
just huge ranges of applications. And if you're building for it specifically, that's when it really starts to matter. You know, we've seen all these Oculus demos that have just been like, well, let's just bolt it into the TF2, or let's make Quake Run 1 work with it. And, you know, it's really fascinating, but it's not something you really want to do. Right. So until they start, uh, until they get the install base to where, you know, great development teams can make marquee experiences that they can sell in the mainstream, until like that huge chain of events happens, I feel like it's going to be a lot of very interesting kind of tech demos and, and, and sort of uh, smaller experiences that are going to get like people like us very excited. And then it will be kind of on us to evangelize it to that larger crowd. And you know, once the numbers get to where they need to be, then hopefully the games all line up. Okay, cool. Thanks for your question. <laughs> hey, Jeff, hey. huge fan of the site. Um, I was wondering how you felt about Twitch, because Twitch is getting bigger and bigger. Like, it has more traffic than Facebook now, which I think is insane. Yeah. And I was wondering, like, do you think that it's a bubble that's going to burst? Do you think it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger? Do you think publishers are going to crack down more? Because you saw, like, Titanfall 360 right. stream before anyone else saw footage of it. And do you think there should be more weird experiments, like Twitch plays Pokemon and Salty Bat? What do you think? I think all that stuff's going to happen. You know, it's, it's a... It's a very disruptive thing. As someone who uh, has been reviewing games on an embargo style system, the idea that uh, live streaming and YouTube uploads have been completely democratized decimates uh, my business in the traditional sense. And it, it's awesome. I, love, I, I can't wait for it to totally destroy. Because I, I feel like, you know, I, I feel like I'm pretty adaptable. You know, when that stuff comes, I'll figure out what we're going to do and what's going to make sense for us. I feel like a lot of the people that are reviewing games right now are not going to be able to do that, and it will crush them. It is crushing them, because why would you go read a review of a game if you're watching it being streamed for three days ahead of time? Uh, and, and Twitch is just uh, in, just amazing. I think it will change. I think the business of it's going to change. you got a lot of people making money off of it right now that uh, publishers very much want a piece of, and uh, the monetization of that and YouTube is... Uh, <laughs> You kind of see it starting to happen. You kind of see the, the, the money not maybe not being there uh, as much as it used to be. And you see more and more publishers being itchy about it and going like, you know, this is these are our video games. You need to give us a cut. In fact, we're just going to flag all your videos on YouTube and take all of it because the fair use, you know, the fair use makes no uh, concession for monetization. And eventually we're going to have to have that fair use fight to figure out what we can really do. Uh, and in some ways, this entire business has been leading up to that fair use fight for over 20 years. LucasArts used to threaten to sue us when we ran screenshots of their Star Wars games. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I think our response, generally the, the legal response was like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and they would eventually go away and realize, you know, it was just like some crazy person. You know, like Nintendo tried to stop uh, Smash Brothers from being an Evo last year. Uh, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's easy to look at it and go like, oh, those guys just don't get it. But there's always going to be some guy in a suit somewhere that looks at the money coming in going, that's our stuff, we should get a cut. And uh, eventually they're going to figure out how to get their way. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Joe. Hey. Uh, my question is more about video, of video games on the internet, and do you think that that has changed how games are designed? Uh, with games like uh, Surgeon Simulator or Goat Simulator uh, playing really well on like an unprofessional Friday or PewDiePie video or something yeah. like that versus like something a little bit more down tempo. Right. I, I, I think that there's, there's definitely an aspect of like, you know, those games might not be able to exist uh, in, a, in a kind of traditional like this is a business and we're selling copies of it sort of sense if that sort of stuff didn't exist uh, because you do have a uh, just a, a long room full of people that are waiting to kind of play stuff like that in front of people. So kind of the, the spectator aspect of, of video games, I think, enables games like that to a certain extent uh, because it helps word of mouth travel a lot faster. Um, but that's actually a weird case where, like, you know, with Goat Simulator, like, I watched it being played two or three times before I got to it myself, and I sat down and went, like, all right, Goat Simulator, this is a great time. And like, well, I've already seen everything. All right, well, I'm going to go... <laughs> get the go head, I'm gonna go get the jetpack, and uh, like I ended up having kind of a, a, a sour time with it because I had already seen all of it. It seems like this proliferation of tiny weird games is kind of perfect for you. I mean like frog fractions could have never existed without the internet, right? I, well, it could have existed, it just wouldn't have, you know, just no, like, no who would have, you know, who would have, who would have noticed. Uh, yeah, and, and that's kind of a, a dangerous thing, you know, it's, it's, 
it's very easy to want to uh, sink into we're only going to cover the weird games or we're only going to cover the bad games. You know, you have a lot of people on YouTube that are just basically like playing a character and just going like, well, we're going to focus on the worst games imaginable and, and try to eke out a living doing that. And I think that's fine. Like, you it, know, seems, it seems like you guys really are careful about how you toe the line of just playing games because they're funny bad. Like the Barbie Dreamhouse game. Right, yeah. It, it's hard sometimes. you know. And, and sometimes we, we make a bad pick and end up running the video anyway. Cause it's like, well, we spent the time doing this. Let's at least let people see it. But it, it's, it's why we don't do, you know, there was a lot of people, there were, were a lot of people that felt that we should play one FMV game per week on our Friday live show. Uh, because we had a stretch where we kind of were doing that, but it, that was almost accidental. Uh, and it was one of those things where it's like, okay, we're, we're going we're gonna to ease back from this because, uh, you know, there are, A, there are not enough FMV games to do that for very long. <laughs> and, and B, you know, we, we want to try to surprise people. We want to try to mix stuff up. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, we, we constantly get things from people saying, like, why don't you do more of this? Why don't you do more of this? And it's like, yeah, we could, but I want to be more experimental. I want, I want to be out there trying to do different stuff and, and, and trying to lay the foundation for doing different stuff. It's hard because not only are we not doing the existing stuff, but there's a certain element of like we're not we have not replaced some things yet, uh, and and that's a it's a frustrating spot to be in. Thanks. Jeff, I just have one quick question. All right. Speaking of frog fractions, is this talk secretly frog fractions too? If you <laughs> yes, if you just, yes. <laughs> all right, we'll all get your frog fractions two keys at the end of this. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, I I, have, I don't remember what they were, but there have been two games so far that I've played and thought like, wait a minute, is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, awesome! Thank you. An iron brew. Er, er, iron brew. Iron brew. Iron brew. I can't find Made it. Made from thirst. Yeah. It's I had to terrific. Bike about three blocks. Oh wow. To roll away. I thought you were going to say you had to smuggle blocks. that back from a country in some <laughs> orifice or something. Have you ever had iron brew? As an intimate, it's, it's it's a very different experience you altogether. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it certainly does. Yeah. It certainly does. Um, I guess my question: you you brought up um, uh, Ground Zeroes very briefly, and thinking about not just the DLC debate whether or not they're complete games and whether or not you have the full value of the game at that point, but games that are made like Titanfall doesn't have a single player mode. Ground Zeroes you can finish on a bathroom break, uh, but they're both. Full sixty dollar retail games. Ground Zero is thirty. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, it's yeah, yeah. thirty games. I bought thirty dollar games. I bought that. But my question is, for a lot of people, it's still this is a commercial product. What's the value in like hours of entertainment and way to get out of it? Right. And uh, even even you guys cater to that uh, mindset occasionally. And I guess just my question is, do you see that ever changing? Do you ever think it's going to be the way where you pay? Sixty dollars for a four-hour game, but that's just sort of what it's, it is expected because it's a high-quality product made by dependable people. And I, I think that I think the expectations for length in games has really changed. You know, uh, just because as the cost of content creation goes up, you know, it's not the sixteen-bit days. We're not making SNES games. We're not just drawing pixel art and able to just pipe that into a ninety-hour RPG. Uh, you know, uh, everyone has to go and, and just create all that content that people are going to see kind of once. It's, it's been this interesting thing where I can't tell you how many Game Informer or Kill Screen articles I've read that disclaim we don't like to factor cost into our review and then go on to factor cost into their review. Yeah. I think that it's one of those things that is part of buying advice. You know, it, it, we, we don't know how much money the person reading that review has. To them, $60 might be a mere pittance, whatever. I'm going to buy everything. Uh, and they want to know more about the quality. For them, the time is more important. Uh, and that's, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people live on both sides of that line as they grow up. You know, as a kid, uh, I didn't buy that many games. I couldn't afford that many. So I wanted to make sure that the games I was going to purchase were games that would last, were games that I could spend a lot of time with and play over and over again and enjoy. And then you had stuff like Strider on the Genesis, which you <laughs> buy for $80, bring home and complete, and you're like, <laughs> uh, or you know, Golden Axe. Like you know, in the early Genesis days, kind of late NES, like there were just a ton of games that were just arcade ports, and they were still full price. And you went and got them and finished them immediately because you'd played it at the arcade before, and you're just like, I, this is a horrible waste of time. So, but as you grow up, as I've grown up, you know, I'm getting to a point where like the the notion of spending sixty dollars on a game, eighty dollars on a game, it's not that big of a deal compared to what it used to be. So, if you were seventeen now, would you see yourself not playing games like Gone Home? 
short experiences like that, I, or emotional experiences. I totally understand, well, as a 17-year-old, I would not be looking for emotional experiences in video games. I'd be looking for shoot shit in its face. <laughs> I mean, that's just the... You didn't unlock that in Gundam? No, no, it's, I'm, workshop support is going to get there. Uh, and, and so, yeah, like, I, I understand the mentality of people that feel that way. I just think they're being, like, unreasonable about how they're expressing it. Uh, no one's taking away the types of games that they like to make these other games. Gaming is just getting bigger. Uh, and, and that's fine. And, uh, yeah, the, the value thing is hard. Like, you don't want to factor it into reviews, but at the same time, like, people need to know. And it's not necessarily a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just like, this is how many hours it took me to spend it. This is how much it cost. Do with that information what you will. Yeah. Uh, I, was, uh, I was wondering uh, if I, how you could think back to, like, how, like, you know, where people games are going in, like, the 90s or uh, like, late uh, compared to like how they exist now, and uh, like how how different was like what people get right, what people get wrong. So yeah, so what people get right and what people get wrong in their games now, yeah, or what people got got right and wrong back then. Yeah, so compared to now, how people got things wrong then. I think uh, you know how people got things wrong then. You know, in the eighties and nineties, like I said, you had the, a lot of the coin op developers trying to make home games, and sometimes that worked, and sometimes it didn't. Yet. You know, NBA Jam trying to like bolt on a season mode or something because they needed one more menu option to try to convince you that this was the the home version that you needed to buy. Uh, whereas now, you know, I, I think you know, gaming is it's gotten cinematic in a way that matters. You know, it's not that kind of just like half-ass kind of chintzy uh, PS1 era cinematic type stuff. Um, and and that's a valid part of the experience. And I think it's changed a lot of how I perceive games along the way too. Because I think back to games like Metal Gear Solid and think like the number of cutscenes compared to hours of gameplay in this product is ridiculous. Uh, you know, the, the action's not that much fun. It's just like this preachy tail. Like you get the bird at the end of it. It's like, what is going on? Uh, if that game came out today, it would fit in perfectly because, you know, games have changed since then. The, the nature of what we're expecting from a product has changed since then. But I think that what people are getting wrong right now is that they're, they're not giving the players enough credit and they probably have the focus test data actually back it up, which is tragic in its own weird way. But the over-tutorialization of games, uh, the, the lack of surprise in today's games, uh, and, and even games that attempt to surprise were now out there on the internet trying to be the first ones out there with strategy videos, where to find all the dangerous artifacts, and, uh, and you know people selling strategy guides and stuff like that. Like That's, uh, that's frustrating as well. So. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the games in, the, in the, the late 80s and 90s were interesting because they were starting to transition out of the arcades. You started to see more of the, the PC, home computer influence get in there and, and make longer, more interesting experiences. And that was very right, but sometimes they got it wrong with coin-op conversions. And then now it's, you know, they're cinematic, but they're just all so easy. Hi, Jeff. Uh, hi, Alex. I can't wait for the next episode of Power Bombcast. Lots to talk about. Uh, yeah, it's been a week it's been a for wrestling fans. Yeah. <laughs> man, uh, man. Royal <laughs> Rumble. But uh, my question is, I'm currently in a communications and marketing track, uh, trying to get into public relations. And just wondering, from your side of the industry, what do you wish more upcoming PR and marketing people did and didn't do? You know, What can the Matt Atwoods of the world teach us? Uh, you know, like Matt Atwood's a great example of someone who played the games and knew what he was talking about. And uh, and and people people in public relations roles, you end up with people that are trying to promote a game to you that you know they don't even believe in, but they won't tell you that. Uh, so uh, some amount of trust and some amount of honesty. And like, you know, I, I had PR people come to me and say, like, "Hey, look, this game's not great, but I'm bringing it around on tour. It's a driving game." You know, look at it and, and, and maybe cover it or something like that. Like, yeah, sure. Like, I'd be more likely to take that appointment than someone saying, like, we've got the greatest driving game in the world right now. I'm like, no, you fucking don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they're not taking Drive Club anywhere. That's not <laughs> it's hiding in a hole somewhere. <laughs> They'll figure it out someday. Next to E.T. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, honesty uh, out, of a, out of a public relations person is probably the, the most valuable thing. And a, a real understanding of the products. There were definitely a lot of people over the years that you know they were promoting the products based on bullet points that they were fed by a producer or something like that, and, and they don't know the game that they're trying to, to push on you. 
So, yeah. so your relationship with PR people and marketing people is interesting because Giant Bomb, you guys are friends with a lot of people in the industry. Um, like your friend with John Drake, who does PR for Harmonix. He's gotten out of PR, but yeah, he's still kind of still, in a PR role. I think yeah. he's PR for he's like Fantasia. He's director of publishing or he something. Every, I don't know what that guy does. <laughs> <laughs> flies all over. Uh, your friend with Brad Mir at Double Fine. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the boundary? Do you think there's a boundary that, because I remember when you did Building the Bastion, you guys didn't review that game because you felt you were too close to the team. Right. Do you think you can still make that choice? Because I feel like you guys are so close to so many teams now. Yeah, I, I mean, what that, the thing that's changed is that we're putting those relationships on camera. You know, you encounter the same people over and over again at PAX and E3 and GDC, and uh, you know, when they're out on tour showing a game. You know, the the main thing that's changed is that you know we've gotten to a point where we kind of have this you know tight knit circle of people that we're always looking to get more people in the mix um, that can speak freely about the industry at large and not just about their product. Uh, and, and we've been lucky to have a, a number of people that, that we, can, we can bring in for stuff like that and, and have a lot of interesting conversations. Yeah. So, I guess, so I guess what I'm wondering is where is that line where you feel like you've been compromised? Because right. I assume you guys are going to probably review Fantasia. Probably not. Really? <laughs> yeah. As, just because of what it is? As the, as the guy that inadvertently got those two sides talking, no, we will not <laughs> review Fantasia. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 Is that through? Is that through John Pinocchio and yeah. John Drake? Yeah. Uh, Johnny needed Drake's number for something and he's like, hey, I got, I'm going to pitch you. I got Fantasia things. Yeah, you're crazy, but okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so the line. The line, I, you know, I think that there's, uh, we have not established a hard, fast line, but it's one of those things that I look at and think about what would I rather be doing? How would I rather be spending my time? And it's one of those things I think further pushes me in favor of like reviews are not the answer because that stuff I think it leads to so many more interesting pieces of content. It's, than the, the average typical review, and it clears up some of that confusion, I think, for people too. But you know, yeah, like we probably wouldn't cover Massive Chalice and, and some of that sort of stuff, but at some point you're like, man, this is, a really, this is an increasingly long list of games that we can't really cover anymore. It's really crazy. You know, at some point it's like, well, you know, now, you know, Adam Boys, who was at Capcom and Beefy Media, and now he's like on stage at E3, like at some point it's like, well, I guess we can't review anything from Sony anymore. <laughs> I've, I've met that guy's kids, they're wonderful. Like at some point it's like, okay, is that, can I just not cover any of those games anymore? Um, so yeah, we're, we're in a very interesting spot, and it, it is quite literally one of those things that keeps me up at night, trying to figure out like what is the right way to handle this situation we found ourselves in. Yeah. But I, I assume you'd rather be friends with those developers than skew that in favor of reviews. I think so. I think, you know, there are so many other people doing reviews and so few people doing the other stuff that we do that I think it's it's just it's a smarter uh, thing to do and it's more fun for me. Like, if I just had to go back to, like, sitting in a bunker and, like, not answering my phone and reviewing games, which was, you know, eight years of GameSpot uh, of, like, okay, I'm, I'm never going to talk to a developer. I'm going to sit here face down and just get these game reviews done one after the other. I don't want to do that anymore. I've, I've done that. It's not, it's not for me. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. You talked earlier about games are getting more mature or, or being more thoughtful, and it seems like a lot of that has been through the indie scene. But I mean, even games like The Last of Us have sort of, you know, used interactivity, which is sort of that that unique you know, it factor that a medium brings, and using that in an artistic way. But I think you know, we've talked a lot about value in games, and also the idea of, of games. Sort of being an escape that you know, I'm playing this, you know, to shoot shit in the face. So yeah. I don't have to think about my problems. Um, so, I mean, as we move forward, do you think that there will be games, or do you think that there will be even big budget games that aren't afraid to sort of, you know, demand a little bit more from the player, to demand sort of, you know, interpret me, or, or you right. know, maybe even make the player feel bad, like in the way that literature or art yeah. can do. I hope so. You know, that's it's one of those things that I feel like you know the the medium should aspire to. Uh, especially at that big budget level. Um, but at the same time, with the amount of money that's going into those big budget projects, so many of them just get focus tested to hell. So many of them have to appeal wide. It's the thing that we lost when we actually gained this great indie scene. There are all these indie scenes that have cropped up all over the place, is that mid-tier publisher that would take those chances. Uh, the midways of the world, THQ before THQ got terrible. Uh, yeah. That kind of the company would be willing to make those B tier games and go like you know what someone's gonna play this someone who really likes games is gonna play this they're gonna play Alter Echo and say like this game's not good but this these two things in it I really like 
uh, mechanically even. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that's, it's hard, you know, to, to really get those games that are, are more evocative and more emotional and stuff like that and still make your $100 million game a success. In a weird way, you know, Grand Theft Auto V is a pretty risky thing. Um, but because they've been doing it for so long and, and, you know, have earned the trust of the shareholders of their company and all this other stuff, they get to write their own ticket. And until they screw up, they'll get to keep writing their own ticket. Irrational was able to write its own ticket until Infinite came in a little bit under where they were thinking. And it's like, okay, well now some things have to change. Um, and, and that's the, it's the sad reality of it. I would love to see just huge budget, just lush, beautiful environments that are really challenging and, and, and really emotional and, and really different. Um, but, you know, and just till something changes on the business end of things, like I, I feel like we're in for a whole lot of uh, first person shooters still. <laughs> do you think people like, like a Jonathan Blow or somebody who's sort of. Uh, <laughs> who's sort of bridging the gap in a sense now with the witness? Um, do you think that might be the road that we see that? I think that what's, you know, what's, what's going to happen is. is uh, the tools have gotten so much easier to use. Development has just gotten so much easier to undertake on a, on a smaller scale, and outsourcing has become huge. So I think what someone will do is you'll have someone like a Jonathan Blow, someone like a, a small team that will then say, all right, we're gonna take this money and we're gonna outsource a whole lot of art and a whole lot of design and bring it all into this game. We're gonna be the figureheads keeping it, you know, keeping it on track, keeping the emotion there, making sure we're telling our story uh, and, and using outsourcing to try to do that at a reasonable cost. And uh, you know that's the sort of thing that you know, you know maybe you can see it on Kickstarter. Maybe you can see someone you know, like, like Sony seems to be making some weird investments and, and stuff uh, over time. Microsoft needs to to do more in, in that arena too. So you could see someone just saying like, okay, we're going to make our we're going to make our play here for this style of game and, and hope it works. Uh, I think it's possible. It's just it's it's very hard. Thank you. Hey Jeff. Hey. Hey Alex. Um, so with the. <laughs> <laughs> I'd make sure you're still there. <laughs> With the increasing popularity of like experimental indie games such as Gone Home and Proteus, there are a lot of people out there who are just saying like those aren't games. And like, where do you draw that line? What do you think makes a game a game? It doesn't matter. That's the thing. It doesn't matter. Um, it's. Uh, I think that those things take the form of a game. You know, you can look at them and go like, well, they don't have a traditional goal or something like that. It those people that are fighting that, that argument are fighting the same argument I fought when Mist was released. Which was, you look at Mist and it's just like this point and click video thing and it's just like playing videos like click. It's the same way I kind of felt about Dragon's Lair when it came out. It's like, these aren't games, it's not real. I'm not, Doom is a game, Mist, what, the, what is Mist? <laughs> Doom um, is going to be a game. Yeah. Eventually, they will make Doom again. It's going to be a point click adventure. It's weird. Um, so, you know, in some sense, I get that argument. And it, and it does come from that place of, like, I don't want to see games taken away from me. I don't want to see games grow up into this other stupid thing because I like what, what, the way they are now. And it's, it's that fallacy because those types of games aren't going away. Games are just getting wider and, and more interesting and stuff like that. So it's, it's been this weird topic of conversation online, and it's, like, just really hard to engage with because I just think... It's, it's one of those art things of like, you know, I don't know, or I know when I see it, or, you know, it, it's, it's a really strange uh, line. Uh, but, but for the record, I think those are both games. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Hey. Uh, thanks for coming to New York. Um, so I think back to your four to five review, um, where you said something like, this is a great game, but oh my god, they beat you over the head with microtransactions. Um, do you think that sites like yours and GameSpot and wherever can serve more as a voice for the consumer against stuff like that. Is it even possible in this in this business? I don't think so. I think that you know the, the reviews and stuff like that matter in terms of how the games get scored and you know it's like on some level a man in a suit looks at Metacritic and figures it out from there. Um, but I don't know if they're really reading reviews and taking that stuff to heart because the people that would read those reviews might be against it as well. You know, might, someone could have come in and said, "No, here's, you know, here's the business model we're going to put into this game," uh, and I, I think that, that that might be the thing. I, I think the, the the stuff with that is it is all kind of voting with your dollar type stuff. They will look at data, they will look at charts and graphs, and if stuff ain't selling, they'll adjust. 
Uh, if they go too far with a free-to-play game and with microtransactions to the point where they can't make money on it, they'll pull back and figure out where the line is. And we're in a very tumultuous time with all that stuff. It will eventually come to a happy medium. They will eventually figure it out. But right now, it's, it's still new enough to where I think the people that have been playing games for a very long time are just get angry about it. Uh, and uh, it's, they're just not there yet. But uh, they care enough about microtransactions and free-to-play stuff that they will eventually find the line. Uh, and with any luck, it'll be in a spot. They'll build it in such a way that we don't feel slimy about it either. Uh, I have my doubts, but hopefully. <laughs> right. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, hi, Jeff. Hey. Uh, as previously mentioned, we had a very emotional week in wrestling. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, the Ultimate Warrior has passed on. Uh, he gave a very... Yeah. Yeah. He gave, yeah. yeah. He gave a very solemn promo, and uh, Jeff, I know you're going to be in a Royal Rumble this Sunday, and I feel it'd be proper if you were to cut a promo in advent of your match. Uh, we are shooting that tomorrow, so. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jeff, hey, uh, so my question is, uh, why and how did you get in, uh, why and how did you, uh, yeah, interested in one genders. <laughs> uh, no, Windjammers is so good. <laughs> no, really, really. No, it's so uh, you know we we had started looking. I, I think right now you're seeing a big rise in game in local multiplayer again, local competitive multiplayer, team based multiplayer, uh, stuff like Towerfall, Samurai Gun, uh, Nidhogg, like like all that sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, I came into possession of an Omega, which is a consoleized Neo Geo system. And we started looking like, you know, we need some more games for this thing. And it was just, you know, Vinny had played a lot of Windjammers uh, before. And, you know, I played a little bit, but not as much as, as Vinny had. He was like, man, we need to get full of Windjammers. And we were, able to, uh, we, were, we were able to come into contact with a copy of Windjammers. And uh, we all just kind of fell in love with it uh, over again. And, and started playing it. My understanding is that it does make random appearances kind of throughout the fighting game community. Uh, I know uh, Keats, the guy that developed Dive Kick, won a Windjammers tournament in Chicago <laughs> and five or six years ago or something like that. So it just kind of comes and goes. Uh, Dive Kick, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Windjammers will just always be around. <laughs> <laughs> Dive Kick will not always be around. <laughs> that thing's got about another three months on <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, Windjammers is just a, it's a it's a very fast paced kind of competitive classic, uh, and it's uh, it, it really sticks out. And it'd be fun to see someone make another one, uh, but I am convinced that if someone had to make another one, they'd just screw it up. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hey Jeff. Hey. Uh, how do you feel about the cult of personality around Valve and how they've been able to aggregate massive amounts of power without getting any criticism or at least concern over how much power they have. It's super scary. <laughs> <laughs> that, like, what is that? What are you doing in there? <laughs> it's like just a bunch of desks on wheels and theoretically they can roll them anywhere. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, suddenly, like, yeah, my living room is now uh, somehow annexed by Valve. Uh, you know, Valve is in this position where they are a private company that is making so much money on Steam that they don't have to answer to anyone, they don't have to ship games on a timetable, they don't owe you anything, <laughs> and yet they still tend to do right most of the time. Uh, I think that some of the stuff they're doing is, is potentially scary, but they've, they've built up a lot of trust with their audience. They have a relatively good track record of not screwing their, their fans or you know, their customers over, and I, I think that gives them a lot of slack. Uh, so either they're setting them, themselves up for a gigantic switch and it's going to go full evil, any day <laughs> or they're just gonna never ship a game again and just be a store, or you know, I, I, or you know, what what is games just gonna start selling a knife sharpening kit on Steam? <laughs> it's, it's worth noting that you talked in the past about people are very quick to be angry by DRM. Like Steam is pretty much the most invasive DRM you can imagine. Yeah, I mean they, they have an offline it. mode, you know, they have stuff, but yeah, yeah, and and yeah, that's definitely like if you looked at what the original Xbox One DRM was like, like it wasn't that far apart from what Valve does. Uh, so now, that's an interesting thing. Now that the Xbox One is out, you talked earlier about how it, their changes didn't seem so much that they were trying to make the consumers happy, so much that they lacked a vision. 
Do you still feel that's the case? Uh, yeah, I, I think they do. I think, you know, putting Phil Spencer in charge over there, I think, you know, will hopefully give them the vision they need in a gaming capacity. Because, um, you know, a lot of the talk leading up, they, they would come meet with us and spend some time talking about, like, oh, the HDMI, the IR Blaster, and TV, and all the stuff. I'm like, I don't care. Um, and, and I think they've finally gotten the message on that one that they need to, to care about games. Um, and, yeah, it's an interesting thing. But, yeah, Valve might be, they might have a nuclear device in there, right? Like, <laughs> no one really knows. Um, but you know, there's been some people kind of getting out of there recently, and you know, it's it's hard to it's hard to know what the future holds for them. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Jeff. Hey. Uh, I study at the NYU uh, Galton, but I also study game writing, game criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the past year, I've been writing online, uh, thanks to Chris Pine back there. Uh, I interned for Polygon. I went to my first E3 last year. Went to GDC a couple of weeks ago for another website. I'm going to PAX East for press this weekend. <coughs> And I'm not going to ask you about what I should do next because I still study. My question is, what do you think the role of game journalists, and this is also for game dev as well, of the legacy of like making an audience? Because I also moderated at Polygon, and I read what people say to these editors directly. I have to click delete on so many comments yeah. and send them. Polygon, right? Well, like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll stop posting the comments. Fine. <laughs> But I have to send warnings and uh, ban messages to so many people, and I write about games as well. So it's like this weird, like you talk about just staying up at night and thinking about your, the, where the line is. Like, why would I, would I stay up thinking up at night? Like, why would I get into this? Why would I opt into this? Yeah, it's uh, this? it's one of those things where you know, like the number one question is like, how do I get into this line of work? And it's like it's hard to give the answer. Of like, you should really make sure you know what you're talking about before you do that, because <laughs> uh, it's weird. How does that GD? parties and I won't name editors but I won't name editors, but they were like, you shouldn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> this way of life is going away. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I'm still in college. And they were like, don't do this. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, don't. It was Brad. Yeah. <laughs> He's just afraid that someone's going to come take his job. Uh, <laughs> no, but there, there may actually be an element there. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> not here, not here. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a weird line of work. And it's changed, uh, you know, when I first started, there there was no notion of like video reviews or video anything or podcasts. It was just we were literally just showing up and writing things in a dark room uh, and going home to another dark room uh, <laughs> and playing more games. And and you know eventually we we got more into cameras and video and all that sort of stuff and started doing video reviews. And uh, you know I had done uh, you know myself and, and Ryan McDonald who was still at GameSpot and has been there forever. Um, had done public access television. So we kind of just had some on-camera experience when the time came to start doing that. And we ended up being a little further along than, than just about everybody else when it came to that stuff, uh, while also kind of knowing the game end of it. And now, you know, we, we always used to joke when it came time to hire people, it was like, maybe we should start asking for headshots and reels and, and that sort of stuff. And like, we're kind of there. Like I'm getting ready to start thinking about bringing people on, and I have to make sure that they can conduct themselves effectively on a podcast. I have to make sure that they can talk naturally in front of a camera or in front of a crowd, uh, because like like it or not, like that is just the new status quo for this job. And if you can't really do that stuff, at some point you're severely limiting the jobs you can take, um, and at, at some point you're you're kind of limiting yourself to, to being a freelancer, um, because then you're out of the office and you're just kind of writing stuff. Your dark room. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the, the job has changed a great deal. And it's, you know, some people have tried to specialize in different ways where they've got the writers doing the writing and then they've hired on camera talent to be presentable, unlike me and all this other stuff. So, in some ways, I feel like the, the people that are in this line of work now, like we're like Toto or something. We're like the, the last bands that were big before MTV. Uh, we're the ugly motherfuckers that can still, you know, carry through because we've been doing it since before then. But now there's like this very much like you have to be slick, video ready to go. It would help if you knew how to edit stuff, uh, and it, it's it's very different. So kind of quite literally grandfathered in on some of that stuff. Be careful. It's interesting that games could theoretically every game we play now could theoretically be unavailable to us in 15 years. Yeah, right. They'll just be obsolete. Mm -hmm. So. 
a lot of what's going to remain is writing about games. A lot of that is happening on journalism websites or review-based websites. Now, Stuck Ops Line had an entire book written about it, yeah. which is kind of funny, but what it's really telling us is that almost any game could have an entire book written about it. Yeah, maybe. So, what do you think? Do you think your legacy is going to be just explaining to people why these games are worthwhile? I think so. I think, you know, hopefully there's that aspect of it. Hopefully we entertain some people along the way. Um, you know, I, I don't really think about it too much. I think, uh, you know, I, I do think about writing a book at some point because at this point, you know, doing this this long, like there, I've seen a lot of really crazy things. Uh, and there, there, there is that tell-all book that can happen. There are just too many people that still have jobs in the industry that I can't <laughs> totally destroy. Uh, so, you know, give it another 10, 15 years and, and, you know, something like that starts to make sense. And, you know, the industry will be old enough at that point that, you know, it's old enough now that, you know, you could, you could see someone from the very early days, you know, writing uh, about that aspect of it. It's just that stuff just hasn't really happened yet. So, you know, now that we're documenting way more of it, I mean, you go back far enough, go back to the 8-bit Nintendo days, it's hard to get static, like, good solid release dates for some games because it was so crazy. And just like the data doesn't exist. Names of developers. Yeah, yeah, names of developers. Yeah, like, who, who is Yuki Chan's Papa? We actually know, <laughs> we type in Yuki Chan's Papa on the side of the page. We figure that out. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, the, just like that sort of data is getting slowly lost to time. Uh, and even some of the games are. You know, I, I heard a story about a game that was coming out to Virtual Console, and it was a Japanese developer. And the only thing they could find were printouts of the original source code. That was all they had. And they had to scan it, like the OCR it, and then manually check it to make sure that it was right to, to get this thing. It was the only way they could do this remake or whatever it was they were doing. Uh, so like the, the preservation aspect of it is getting a lot more important for those games. But preserving today's games is going to be solely up to pirates and hackers. Uh, the you know People will find ways to get at the Xbox One and PlayStation 4, you know, hopefully years down the line, so it doesn't destroy the business aspect of it just yet. Um, and either emulate those games or figure out ways to, to play all those games or private servers for games that require connectivity and stuff like that. Like, you know, that stuff does happen and it's increasingly important now because you definitely can't count on the companies to really care about that stuff unless they intend to re-release it and sell you something that is not the original thing anymore. Uh, hi Jeff. Hey. My question isn't really related to video games because one day I started playing Dota and now my life is in shambles. <laughs> Gone home is a game. Dota is not. <laughs> um, anyway, my question relates to Riff Raff. He uh, recently announced that at some point during his tour when he's not hanging out with Katy Perry, uh -huh. Neon Icon will be released. Yeah. Are, you, are you excited for this? I am very excited for the release of Neon Icon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did forget to ask one question from the forums, which is when are you making your comment? music. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's something we occasionally talk about, but it's, there's nothing in the works just yet. It takes time. <laughs> you have you so do. much. Right. <laughs> Before I ask my question, I just want to thank Alex, because when I was in high school, some uh, a friend of mine told me that I should check out this website called GameSpot and check out this real cool video that was hilarious, this review for this game called Big Rigs. <laughs> <laughs> about my legacy, I don't know. Alex was written years ago. That's all of it. But uh, that's how I ended up finding about you and Ryan and followed you guys ever since. Here we are. So, uh, But my question for you has to do with arcades. Um, the early days of gaming were rife with uh, home ports of arcade games. And I went into an arcade for the first time in about 10 years and I saw the most bizarre thing. There were arcade ports of home games. There was a Guitar Hero yeah. arcade cabinet, and there was a Line Runner arcade cabinet. It was really bizarre. Um, but do you see a place for arcade games in modern society, sort of beyond the nostalgia factor of, you know, things that are popping up like barcades and right, that have all the old games? I, I think that you know, like the the, the there's still going to be. I think that could be a potential early thing for VR. Where it's you know you, you might not understand it if it's in your home you know you might not understand it enough to bring it into your home, but you know just like they started to you know when VR was big last time they started opening like virtuality centers and selling you smart drinks and pico biloba and all sorts of stuff and you put on headset and shoot pterodactyls and all that um, and it was terrible but you know hopefully it will work out a little bit better this time I think like that type of location based entertainment um, has value it's just uh, 
how do you get people out of their homes when there's so much entertainment in the home now with uh, you know just games and just all the things that compete with it, just the internet in general, and you know streaming movies and just like all this other stuff. Like you, you have to make a really strong case just to get people out of their house. So it, I think it, it's one of the things that works in movie theaters and stuff like that. I love the idea of a bar full of people wearing Oculus Rifts. Yeah. <laughs> great. You just gotta get them in like pods. <laughs> <laughs> like they have a button they can hit and a straw in their mouth and then it fills back up. And hey, thanks so much for coming out. Um, I had a question about the site or like the actual voices on the site. You know, like you said before, you're, you, you're six people, you've been six people for a really long time and you've been with those people in different permutations you know, for the site for a long time before that. You know, when you're with all the same people, you do run the risk of sort of having that weird echo chamber effect where you keep talking to the same people all the time yeah. and um, you know, things change and, and you sort of double down on your opinions. How often do you uh, evaluate or like think about the balance between um, becoming out of, uh, falling out of touch versus um, just sort of refining your opinions as like people? Well, I th you know, it's one of those things where by just being personality driven, there's a certain aspect of it to where like, you know, people are there, hopefully, because they want to hear what we have to say about a thing. And when I think about bringing new people in, it's like, okay, is this a person that we can, you know, that will also inspire people to want to come to hear what this person has to say, whether it is completely dissenting with what, where we're at or if it falls in line, is a little less important to me than you know if, if they're saying things that, that people are interested in hearing. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Like we don't get into arguments, you know. Like I've known all those people for a very long time. Like we're, we're you know, our positions are well established, uh, and you know I think for on some level having a happy office uh, it works. You know with, with having that sort of thing, and, and that's why you get a freelance budget. And you can go out and get those dissenting opinions. You know however you need to. Um, but yeah, it, it is something I think about uh, in terms of just like, you know, our, our, I think it's something that everyone has to be thinking about in this line of work because, you know, we are on the cusp of becoming irrelevant. And I feel like I got a reprieve by getting fired and getting a chance to start over because it, it forced me, it, it gave me the chance to really rethink everything that we do. Um, and some of it we kind of doubled down on the way we review games. It's like, oh, we're just going to kind of stick with that. Um, but like, you know, we're not writing previews, really. We're not out there at events, uh, and, and, and we're, we're picking and choosing and trying to be smarter about that stuff. I think someone's going to have to come along and do that again, whether that'll be us or whether it'll be someone else. But at the end of the day, if someone wants to know about Minecraft, we're not the site for it. If someone wants to know about an MMO, like, we're not the site for it. And increasingly, you just have communities around those games that spring up and can cover those games far better than we can ever hope to as generalists. But at the same time, being a generalist, I think, is effective. I think there are still a lot of people out there playing games that play them that way, that care about games enough to not want to hone in and focus on one genre of game or one specific game. Uh, and I think that we still serve a, a wide purpose there. And it's, a, it's sometimes I think about, you know, what, what are the ways that we can, you know, effectively work with uh, some of the people that are in those communities already and, you know, maybe expose their work to a different audience in the process of like, can, can we go find like a, a really great MMO reporter and say, like, hey, we want you to occasionally report on this stuff, and, and will anyone care? Because in a lot of cases, there are plenty of sites already devoted to that, and maybe we should just stay out of it, and maybe that's fine. Uh, as long as we're growing, it's uh, it still feels like there's still more room to move with, with what we're doing. It's interesting that you're so, you feel like the firing in 2007 was beneficial. Your path. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. what do you think the world looks like where you're here talking about your 18 years in GameSpot? I, I wouldn't be here. Like, no one would care. I would have, you know, we would have kept doing on the spot. I would have just kept sitting in a room reviewing games. Uh, you know, the, the ad market would have started to implode. The people would have moved away from the large sites. So, do you not feel like you said you were changing reviews at GameSpot around that time? Yeah. Do you feel that you would have at least veered towards this direction while you were there? Or do you think you wouldn't, you wouldn't have been able to? I don't know. Uh, you know, at some point, uh, you know, like right around the time that I got fired, there, uh, you know, no, there was no higher, there was no one on the totem pole was higher than me that had editorial experience. Um, so it would have been a matter of convincing people that didn't have editorial chops, which is usually really easy. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe I would have changed those things, but it, maybe I would have just remained completely complacent and uh, sat there and collected a check for another seven years or something like that. 
I don't know. Maybe I would have freaked out and had to quit and go pump gas or something. You know, it's hard to know. Uh, that place was not a particularly great place to work for uh, 2006. How long? How far back? When did it get bad? <laughs> I'd say late 06, late 06, early 07. Yeah, I remember commuting with Alex through 2006, and at one point he was just like, dude, I don't think I can do this anymore. And I was like, what? You know, and it's, hard, it's hard for me to have a perspective on that, because like I said, this is all I've ever done. So on some level, there's that aspect of like, if I get out of this, what am I going to go do? Um, so yeah, you know, it, uh, I probably wouldn't be here if that hadn't happened, because it, it, it allowed me to kind of really take a long look at what we're doing and, and make a lot of changes. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Good. Good. Um, not to paint a more of a picture here, but you have companies like Sony. Uh, they sold like 9 million PlayStation 4s. They're still having trouble uh, staying alive. You have Microsoft who has trouble staying alive, but they got rid of their entire, they got rid of their CEO, a bunch of people jumped ship, and Nintendo's pretty much dead in the water. Um, as a console gamer, what do you think is gonna like save console gaming, or do you think the PC master race is gonna come up and rise? I don't think it needs saving. Uh, not this, this, you know, this may be the last console generation. We'll see how it shakes out, but like those nine million, like that's still doing really, really well. When you look at Sony and why they're doing so poorly, it's because they're still trying to sell TVs for way too much money. Uh, and you know, they, had a, they went through a, a lot of issues in other parts of their company that have really dragged down the, the business. But if you look at where PlayStation is at specifically, they're doing pretty well. If you look at where Xbox is at specifically, they're doing pretty well. It's just the rest of Microsoft is trying to find a way to transition into like modern internet and you know, like modern OS stuff and trying to figure out what it all means. Um, but the game divisions seem like they're doing okay. Uh, you're right that it's not outstanding. It's not gangbusters. And uh, you know, the PC is always gonna be the place where you can play the most games. And now that they're all on very similar architectures, like that's great news for PC players, but also great news for console players because they, you know, like it's it's easier to do the work um, and easier to get better games on those platforms. But yeah, I don't feel like console gaming's dead yet. That's one of those things that I, I think a lot of people are saying. There was a big long article I forget who ran it a while ago. That was just like, oh, it's a it's a wreck, and they're trying to tie together like Jack Trent left Sony, and then this happened, and this happened. It's like no, at the turn of a generation. Everyone looks in the mirror and goes, do I want to do this for another seven years? Am I going to sign up for this for another chunk of time? And it's a great time for people to transition out. When Greg Kasavin got out of GameSpot to get into game development, it was right around the turn of a generation where he was like, you know, if I'm going to do it, like now's the time, because everyone has to learn something new. Everyone's learning new platforms, and you, know, you, you can get in there and, and really make some change. Uh, and, and I think that that's, it's, it's too premature to say that like console gaming is dead. Like th those things are actually selling quite well, uh, and they'll be fine for this generation. And I, so I think you know the the mobile aspect that everyone was looking at and going like, oh, mobile games are going to crush it. Uh, they're going to totally destroy console gaming. Like that's a generational shift. And you know when the the kids of today that are raised on playing free to play stuff eventually get to you know our age, you get to the twenties, thirties, stuff like that. At some point, are they just going to go like, I'm never spending sixty dollars on a game that's crazy. And then everyone has to, you know, has to catch up and change. Uh, but until that happens, until that generation comes of age, uh, I think the console game still makes sense. It seems pretty clear to me that the future of consoles is in hundred-dollar tiny set-top boxes. Yep, yep, hundred-dollar Android boxes that stream Netflix and occasionally play a game. That's Here go. No, hell no. Oh. no. <laughs> Who would want that? Um, how you doing? Hey. Uh, it's kind of a tied question to what he was talking about. Um, in terms of like console generations kind of dying out, and uh, it's more tied to uh, digital video game distribution. How uh, a lot of video game companies more now prefer that as their way of distributing games. It's you know cheaper and it's a little more convenient to actually get access to and consume. Um, but there's some of us who still prefer buying physical media. In this case, you know physical copies of games. Right. Um, do you think? it will eventually, say not 10, 15, 20 years from now, we'll get to a point where we'll eventually just completely fade out physical uh, consumption of video games, or do you think there'll still be a niche market for it? I, I think we will eventually get away from it completely. I think you know, you're, you're gonna see you know, even just greater strides in just accessibility to the internet from devices out in the middle of nowhere, you know, uh, faster access. Uh, but all that has to happen. You know, like that, I think that was the, the, the bet that Microsoft was trying to place was, you know, if we go 
all digital, or you know, we, we go all online, all DRM, that bed of like, everyone needs to be connected to the internet. And the numbers just didn't, they weren't there yet. People weren't ready to give that up yet. Um, so but selfishly, not thinking about what would have been best for the company, do you wish Microsoft had stayed with that? Uh, selfishly, I think that uh, I hate bringing disks from to and from work, because sometimes I forget them. So uh, just having the disk, like a, a PC game, where you just install it once and then it's tied to an account somewhere and throw it out, like is actually like beneficial to me. Um, but do you, do you think um, if you buy a physical copy, do you think if you buy a physical copy of the game, they should include a digital copy of the game as well? Yeah, if they, if they could figure that out, that'd be great. But then you're you're basically asking them to turn on DRM for online checks and stuff because otherwise you end up with two copies of the game, one that someone can run off a disk and one that someone can run off the digital. And, and that's why they, they couldn't really do that once they had made their change. If you look at what they're doing right now, you know, enabling digital sales for you know the vast majority of their games is not too far off from Microsoft's original stated objective. All they're really doing is giving you the option right now, hoping that most people will choose the convenience of digital because choosing digital also eliminates used games. And if they can stay competitive with that market, if they can make that an attractive offer, They'll kill used games like they've always wanted to, but because we choose it. Uh, and it'll be that Trojan horse that you'll wake up one morning and go, oh, no, what they, they did it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, know, it, uh, you, you have to assume the internet's just going to somehow find a way to get even more pervasive, and the bandwidth will get even better, and we'll finally get over this whole bandwidth cap thing that everyone's hung up on now, and, and get to a point where everyone can just download stuff. But we're just not there yet. So it, until we're there, we're there. Your physical copies are safe. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, you think increased video content would lead to something like Mega 64 videos on the site, or, or not, not specifically that, but something like that, or long form version of the bumper videos you guys use for uh, Game of the Year, or is that just too much work overall? It's a, it's a lot of work to do that stuff. You know, I I, I really love what Mega 64 does. I, I think that uh, that. Those guys are super funny. Like, I, I want to have them back on the show. I ran into Rocco at GDC. It was good to see him. Um, and and I think that what they do is really good. But I don't want to do that um, because, like, that's that's the danger. Is is you know if we if we completely t remove our editorial voice, then we just we suddenly are just competing with Mega sixty four. I think they already do that really well. Uh, and we're competing with all the people trying to do like video game based comedy on the internet, which I think a lot of it is really bad. But uh, and I think that there's a way to blend the two that ends up being uh, more interesting. So, you know, there, there's stuff I want to do that is a little more serious. There's stuff I want to do that's a little more interviewee and, and a, a little more in-depth than what we're doing right now. Um, but we're weirdos, so who knows how we'll come out on the other end. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So it seems like, uh, if I had a guess, it seems like Giant Bombs, do you think Giant Bombs audience would be receptive to more serious content? Uh, I think that they have been in the past, yeah. I mean, you know, we definitely split the difference uh, across a, a lot of our stuff. And, you know, there are, def there are definitely people that just go like, oh, I don't take anything they say seriously. I'm just there to have fun. And that's fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, hate those people. I think for, uh, <laughs> for all the people at Giant Bomb, this has been a very serious year. Yeah. Um, and I think that I assume you'd agree that the community has really proven themselves to be pretty rad. Yeah, it's awesome. You know, it's, it's one of those things that like someone should be doing a case study on it because you look at it and you're just like, how is this happening? Uh, why are, you know, it's like all these people are so great and they're just making such cool stuff and, yeah. and you know, just the, that power of, of bringing people together in a way that makes sense and feels good and is not some slimy social media plan. Um, and and that's, that's felt really good. Uh, and that's something I, I hope that, you know, kind of as we start to make changes, and you know, it's one of those things where you know, you bring someone new on, people are gonna hate them because everyone just hates change. Uh, but you know, a, as we start to bring people on, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make uh, good decisions, and, and I think people will, will be happy with, uh, with where we take it, assuming we get to take it there. Just still, you know, until there's people Who's in the door. Who's stopping you? Who do we eat Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it's just, it is a slow process yeah. through management, and everyone's in basic agreement on what we need to do, um, but you know, it's just doing it. Just, just doing it. It's, it's new people coming in and going like, wait, what are you doing? Like, okay, well, we're gonna walk you through this one more time. Here's what we're gonna do. <laughs> do you anticipate hiring full-time editors? More full-time editors? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's yes. Cool. I accept. 
<laughs> um, so uh, this has been great. Uh, I'd like to finish by saying that all of us at the Game Center, we're all game developers and designers. We're making games all the time. Some of us couldn't be here tonight because we're making pixel art yeah. or crap. Yeah. So uh, finally, some pixel art. Games. Yeah, exactly. There's just there's just not enough. They're huge. Yeah. Um, so putting yourself in the shoes of a designer, you've seen so many games. Mm -hmm. You've thought about games for such a long time. What do you make? It's something I've thought about a few times. Uh, there was a game, I, so I originally had this idea, it was kind of before Endless Runners had happened, and it was before Harmonite, and basically Harmonite was a game that I at some point was like, I want to make this type of uh, rhythmic platformer, uh, and then Harmonite came out, and I was like, that's 90% of what I would have done. Okay. Uh, do, you feel, do you feel that happens a lot, where you have these ideas for games, and they just, they happen because the collective conscious also has that idea? Uh, I think uh, maybe to some extent, but it, it's something I don't really think about a lot. You know, it's, it's, a lot of people criticize people in my line of work because they, they get the impression that uh, everyone here is just trying to make the jump uh, over into development mm. uh, as if like this is like some amazing job. Like you meet people, sure, and you know, some people have definitely made the jump, but it's like, I don't want to be a community manager. Like, what? Yeah. No, that's, that's it a seems, fine job, but it's like, I don't... It seems now like the jump would be being a journalist and then just making a game. Yeah, like Gunpoint. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he had, you know, been in games journalism and kind of made that on the side. I look at that and go, like, that's awesome. Like, you know, make a game in secret and then go, like, hey, I made this thing, as opposed to, like, I'm going to potentially say really nice things about a company and then, whoops, I work with this company. <laughs> um, yeah, that's you know, which Which, I, you know, I, I don't want to point fingers on that. Like, you know, I don't know, you know if that happens or if it doesn't. You know, people have definitely accused people of doing that in the past. Uh, but I like playing a lot of games. Uh, I've been, you know, doing that for so long now that, like, the, the idea of just playing one game for two years straight as I iterate on it and iterate on it and iterate on it sounds insane. So I'd much rather play two to three games a week and, and just keep burning through stuff. Uh, that, that's kind of more my speed. And, you know, maybe someday it'll make sense. Maybe someday a, a, an offer will come along and be like, okay, well, you know, this actually sounds like it would be completely fun in a different way. And, and you know, let's explore that or something. But uh, it's not something I'm out there actively seeking. It's one of those things, like, if, if I was going to go into development, that's, I would have done it when I didn't have a job. Uh, you know, that, that option was definitely there. Um, and it's uh, it just doesn't sound that appealing. Most of the people that I know that make games uh, are jealous of me. It's like a vice versa thing sometimes. Where like first it's like, oh, you work harder than I do. It's like, no, you work harder than I do. And they're like, okay, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just different because for me, it's like my crunch time ends up being the fourth quarter when there's a thousand games coming out. Every do you week. get tired of playing games? Because I know developers, even us at this early stage, we just don't have time for games anymore. Yeah, so I, I would assume some developers wish they could play more games, and maybe you guys wish you could play less. <laughs> sure, sometimes, yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, it's but it, it, that's been the kind of the blessing about what we've built is that we're not obligated to play everything, mm. um, and you know, we, we get to kind of pick and choose a little more and be a little more targeted with what we're doing, as opposed to like, all right, there are three Naruto games coming out over the next year, and <laughs> we've got to cover them. Like, no, we just. <laughs> We actually do. I, now that I think about it, we actually do kind of cover most of the Naruto games in some way. But you know, we're not playing them to, them to completion. Yeah. I'm not going home and going like, I need to finish this as quickly as possible so I can get this review done so I can move on to the next thing. You should. Like, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. The, the lack of Naruto coverage on the side is really it's, it's an embarrassment. Um, but yeah, it's uh, you know we we get to kind of pick and choose, and that's made the schedule a lot more manageable. You know, there was a. Uh, it's it's. Uh, dumbass sob story, but it, it becomes very hard to fit things like other people into your life when you are uh, reviewing games on that kind of timeline. When yeah. It's just like everything is a deadline, everything's out Tuesday, you're like, when you're not playing a game, you're on the phone asking where the review copy of the game is and why isn't it here yet. It's, and it's kind of unbelievable knowing that Vinny has a like newborn yeah. Over the last year, and he's on so much content as he is. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's yeah, that's crazy, uh, and that's something that's it's you know it'd be hard to dream about that with the way that we were running Gamespot for a while. Like it was very much, uh, it was a hard road. Uh, it was one of those things that you know a lot of people uh, running publications and stuff like that. You know, in, in the years past, 
uh, place no value on their employees because every day you get a thousand emails from people saying, I can do that guy's job better and they'll probably do it for less money. Um, so it was, a, it was a hard fight for a while to get people to understand like, no, these people have lasting value uh, because of their time in the field, their time spent, their knowledge base. And, and that's the sort of the thing we've tried to build is, is something where like, you know, these, these people aren't replaceable. You don't just plug a new person in and move on. It's, you know, this perspective is unique to this person. And, you know, there's still some publications out there that are being run like that, that are just like, there's a million college kids out there, we'll just bring four more in, mm. go ahead, keep complaining, you're just signing your own termination notice. Um, and it's, uh, it can be weirdly cutthroat that way. But I like to think that we've built something that sidesteps significant portions of that in such a way that, like, they can't fire me now. <laughs> <laughs> so what are they going to do? Cool for yeah. Yeah. So, um, like I said, there are a lot of people in this game, in this room that make games. So, as someone who has a tremendous perspective on games, do you have any final words, final thoughts, warnings? Oh, jeez. Um, you know, I just I think that you know rhythm games need to come back. They're super. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> Been, it's been depressing that there's no new Parappa yet. <laughs> yeah, it's like they're, they're still, I mean, not to say that there are no rhythm games happening. There certainly are, but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Chroma, no, that's Chroma's not a rhythm game. Uh, <laughs> I think I violated it. Anyway. Um, yeah, no. I, I think at, at the end of the day, like you know, there are so many different people playing games that you're always going to be able to find someone that's into what you're making. And I think that you know, pushing those boundaries and, and just trying to get out of these set genres and, and really just try to explore and, and figure out something new. Um, you know, the, the dominance of the, the big expensive first person shooter seems like it's slowly coming to an end uh, and something has to pick up that slack at the big level and something is gonna have to, you know, kind of fill up those spaces in, in the smaller games as well. So uh, I would just try something weird. You never know, like it might work, just go nuts. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll try our best. Yeah. Do Thank it. Thank you so much for coming, Jeff. Everyone, Jeff Gerson. <laughs>